Okay. There we have the recording. So let me just share my screen and we can start. Okay, so as my screen is coming up, I see it's already up. Just to open the discussion, we'll be looking mainly at what causal inference is and mainly how it differentiates from statistical associations and how we can just tell the difference. Because, uh, you know, we keep saying that not every time associations actually means causation. So we'll be seeing the difference between the two and maybe just how to tell them apart before we go the practical part so maybe just before i share the small presentation i have here which is shared in the drive could we maybe just open the floor maybe what's your understanding of causal inference so far with the what you've had whatever you've been able to read and how do you think it's different from statistical associations Anyone? Yes, just yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, I think in my understanding, we can say that when we talk about um because of rest, we try to study the a generic relationship that is um is uh, actually causing uh, bringing I don't know a variable, even variable to have an effect on, on another variable. That's mean that we study, for example, why to there's a variable is behaving like a uh, given way because of another, a changing in another variable. But it's different in, with a statistical uh, association because study uh, how variables are correlated. That means how they are associated or something like that. So, but here we study uh, the why the, we answering, we try to give an answer to the why question and also how we the variable behave when we actually change uh, the the treatment variable. So, in summary, basic words, that is what I can say. Okay, thank you for that uh, summary, Justice. You also said you'll be answering the question why. That's good to note because I think we'll also be answering the questions like um, what if. So maybe just uh, to, to open the floor for just one other person because we don't have so much time. Anyone who they have something else to add on about causal, causal inference, causation, and especially how it's different from correlation and association. So do we have anyone else who has an idea? Yes, Fish. Yeah, so uh, I think Josh has really explained it well, but just to add in a uh, few words, I think uh, causality is actually inferring what causes something or what if something happened, what would happen next, like that type of thing, where uh, association basically means like grouping things based on certain dependent and independent values rather than uh, casually uh, inferring what belongs, what happens if what happened. And uh, the correlation part, I think, is like the um, similarity or the, the same type of outcome in variables, even if that doesn't mean they are caused necessarily by the same type of factor. That's basically my understanding. That's all. 
Okay, thank you for that speech. So I did like your definition of uh, correlation, which is also somehow I also understand association. You might actually say that maybe some variables have a certain kind of trend. They have the same kind of trend, but does that mean that they actually cause, they have a cause and effect relationship between between each other. So we'll be looking at uh, some of these things and a few will be mentioning a number of variables and how they are important in causal inference. And for those ones who don't know why we actually need causal inference, it's good to also note out why we need causal inference. So we we did machine learning before and when we do some form of a record recommendation or a prediction, we normally just use all the variables in a in a data set check out if they're correlated what can we drop what just to enhance our models and sometimes the question comes uh which specific variable would we want to actually tweak to actually cause some form of intervention because it actually affects our target variable the most so this is the main question we are trying to and so we're trying, still trying to come up with a machine learning model, but just trying to understand the variables a little bit more, how they relate to each other and how they actually relate to our target variable. So just to introduce causal inference, just uh, like I've said, it's the process of determining the independent actual effect of a particular phenomenon that is a component of a large system. So like we like both Sharefish and uh, Juices have said, when we are doing a causal inference, we are trying to figure out which specific variables, I'll call them variables in these cases because we are, we are all in this space, which one causes the other and uh, not the other way. When you say a cause and effect kind of a relationship, if X causes Y, then there's no way that Y can ever cause X. This is something uh, that we need, we need to know. So when you say, as I was saying, association or correlation, as Fisher, you mentioned something about the difference between association and correlation. And how I understand it, how I've been reading it, is that when we just say association and correlation, just like the statistical inference, they could actually be meaning the same thing. Where you see, like, I was looking at this example and uh, you could notice maybe you are in um in a beach, maybe you live uh, in a location where there's a lot of beach and when it's summertime or when there's so much heat in your area, you see, okay, people are going to the swimming a lot, people are going to the beach and okay, also people are consuming ice cream. So if you see the ice cream consumption is very high, if you only that you only have data for ice cream consumption and you only have data maybe for the number of people going to to the beach you'd actually think that maybe okay so maybe ice cream and going to the beach are actually because they would really have an, a very high correlation but if you just look at these two data independently you won't be able to infer that there's another add variable that actually contributes to this kind of correlation to this kind of association which would be the temperature the weather the season just start to say it like that so when we come up with the causal inference, in real life, you could just have situations like what I've just mentioned, the ice cream and um, going to the beach. And as human beings, you can just infer that there is no way that they are related. So in some cases, like uh, the challenge you have this week, you cannot just be able to directly infer that the correlation you are seeing, the association you are seeing, that they're actually related to each other or not. And that's where causal inference actually comes in to help you just figure out is there a relationship between this X and Y, where X is our ice cream and ice cream consumption and Y is uh, going, going to the beach. So I hope that makes it clear, just an understanding of causal inference. Of course, if we look at it in form of um, more of a diagrammatic statistical approach, in statistics, we always have this given variables, observed data and um, Maybe you're, you're told, okay, so what is the probability that uh, somebody goes to the beach given that they actually took ice cream? So you would actually come up with a probability value like, um, like um, 0 0.1, 0 0.5. It could as well be 0 0.9 because it is summertime. But if you just, the probability of somebody going to the beach, they did take ice cream you would actually see a very high correlation. But when you look at it in a causal, in a causal kind of way and you start to ask questions, maybe do some interventions. I remember somebody this morning asking what interventions. And in this case could be, 
okay, so we are human beings and we know that maybe something that actually contributes more is the temperature, the season. So we are seeing this kind of approach because it is summertime. So what if it is winter? So if we change that season from summer to winter, then what is the probability that somebody will take, will go to the beach if they take ice cream? So when we just do that, <coughs> when we just do that intervention, <coughs> we might be able to see, oh my God. <coughs> I'm sorry about that, guys. My voice seems to be disappearing. <clears throat> Maybe just to open the floor <laughs> before my my voice. I think it's coming back. Okay. Maybe I should go take water. So I don't know if that makes sense up to there. Just the difference between a statistical inference, which is just directly. Mainly if you have data like what we have this week, you can actually come up with any statistical inference depending on the data that you've been given, just your data set. But when you start doing some interventions, like for example, the diagram I'm showing here, in the first one, which is a statistical inference, it's just saying what is the probability of B given A, probability of going to the beach given that you took ice cream. On the other side, we are saying what is the probability? No, 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 no. What is the, okay, so this is not, okay, so in the second one, we are trying to say that we did make a change where the price was actually doubled. So in whatever data this is, and so we are wondering, we already have prices and our question is if we double this price, what is the probability that, that will again have B given that we do A. So given that we double the price for A. So I don't know up to there if we have any question, I want to switch to a more something, another, we have another presentation that is more technical on these terms. Up to there, I don't know if you have a question on just uh, statistical inference versus, versus causal in France, any question up there? Okay, so I'll still just assume that uh, silence means you've understood. My voice is back, lucky. And uh, so shifting to causal, causal in France. Is that a question? Uh, yes, it's a question. Okay, yes, so in the, in the previous slide, you have these graphs, which I didn't understand, honestly. Uh, is it important that we <laughs> that we understand this type of graph in particular, or is it because I understood what you said, but I didn't don't understand the graphs. Okay, so it's, not, it's just a way of trying to explain the difference between causal analysis and statistical difference. So what is happening here is that um, we are just considering a joint distribution between B and A. We've already been given these values in our data, like I have said, and uh, in statistical inference, we just try to get this probability of B given A. I think we, there is actually even a formula <laughs> for the probability of B given A. There's a total formula on that. But in causal analysis, the main important part is that we actually introduce some change that is outside that is outside our, our data set. So a change, like I said, doubling the price, or maybe like in my explanation, uh, changing the season, or um, maybe an example of, um, so anytime you just do a change, you do an intervention to your data set, that is uh, what causal analysis is about. Will you be able to see the exact same kind of um, relationship between your variables? So the main thing in this graph is actually the change part. Another question. Yes, uh, it's a question. Yes, I did it. So, uh, do we have to uh, produce a change in our variables to, like, you know, in the causal analysis? Like, can we just uh, pick a, a, another, you know, some variable and uh, analyze their uh, relationship or like their causality? So we don't, we don't really have to. Let me just, um, let me just switch a little bit to some other document here. So when when I talk about introducing, when I talk about introducing um, 
a change introducing an intervention we'll be mainly to you'll be mainly here hearing this one called a uh, counterfactual which are just questions that lead to your interventions like for example what i just said what if we were to double the price so that becomes a counterfactual that will actually lead to you generating maybe a new set of variables it could just be a set of double prices or a set of uh, new distances maybe for example in this situation but in other cases when you're looking at just the data that you have and you're not considering maybe the counterfactuals it is good to think outside the box and just have the counterfactuals in your data but in some cases we would have um you would i don't know let me just see if this uh this one thing you would you would be considering variables let me just go to this diagram i think this diagram would actually explain it a little bit better what i want to say you would be considering the variables and how they are uh, connected to each other that's for sure under it and let me just let me enlarge this i hope that's a little bit clearer i hope that's clearer and it maybe I'm speaking to you. I hope that image is... Yes, 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 yes. It's visible. Okay. So in this case, you would, let's just consider, I'm looking at the first diagram to my left, and we have uh, X1, X2, X3, all the way to X5. And let's say that these are our, um, are our variables. And you can see, okay, so depending on the season, this would affect whether we do our sprinkler on. So this is maybe for a garden. And depending on the season, we'd also know, okay, so maybe there's rain. If we do sprinkle, if we do some rain, then okay, so our ground will be wet. And if our ground will be wet, then maybe our ground will be slippery. So this is the kind of data that we have, but we now want to do some form of causal analysis. We do notice that season, season actually causes, it is a, it is a factor on whether we do, we turn on our sprinkler or not. It is also a factor on whether there will be rain or not. So the fact that season actually causes the um, the sprinkler and the rain, sorry, how am I missing that? This variable has two outcome variables. We have the sprinkler and the rain. If we don't, if we look at this in a statistical kind of way, we might actually find that sprinkler and rain have some form of association or correlation but if we don't consider season so since we have this kind of data you've drawn some form of a graph which is what again causal analysis will be helping us i'll just mention that in a little bit if we do remove the factor the relationship between the season and the sprinkler which is the community the what we are saying here next something that everybody was also saying this morning the do calculus if you actually do some form of intervention then you can be able to tell if there's actually a cause and effect relationship between the sprinkler and rain i'm saying specifically between sprinkler and rain because they they're both somehow uh caused no, no i don't want to use the word cause in this kind of diagram you'd see that both sprinkler and rain they they are some form of outcomes from season in this case the season if you've been going towards the season is what now we will be calling a confounder confounder variable so if you don't consider season in your data you will definitely see some form of correlation between sprinkler and rain and that's why you need to consider season in your data so in this specific data to see if there's a cause and effect relationship between sprinkler and rain. What this just means in your data, you should be able to identify all confounding variables. I hope by now you understand what these are confounding variables and actually be able to account for them in your data. Because if you don't account for a confounding variable in your data, then you'll see just some random association between some variables. Does that make sense, Andenet? it? Yeah, it doesn't make sense, but if I understand it well, so we introduced changes in uh, like uh, to, to re understand the, uh, or to draw the lines of like the, I mean, the to found the, like the confounding variable. So like if we uh, introduce some changes, we could draw uh, like, or we could validate uh, or analyze uh, the real causality between the variables, right? 
Yes, yes, you actually have to consider all the confounding variables to be able to see that cause and effect relationship. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank okay, you. so I don't know if there's another question or I can just continue. The reason as to why I just went straight to this, to this diagram. In causal inference, we mainly use this form of DAGs. By now, I'm sure most of you know what DAGs are, to actually be able to see the relationship between our variables. And uh, the reason as to why we come up with DAGs, DAGs will be able to tell you which one is the confounding variable, which one maybe is the collider, at what point do we, can I now start to introduce some form of interventions, what can I do? So the best way that causal inference is be, is able to communicate, is able to communicate the information in its data is by, by use of DAGs. I'm just calling them DAGs because you know them as DAGs, which is also acceptable in causal inference, but the term that you'll be seeing used a lot in causal inference will be mainly causal graphs, causal models, structural causal models. So all of these just refer to this kind of diagram that shows some form of nodes, which could be a variable, some form of arrows, which is of course, um, what is the relationship between these two variables and how does it flow? And just like DAGs, it cannot be acyclic. So we cannot say that since here X4, X5 is being caused by X4, at no point do we say that uh, as well X5 causes X4, cause the ground is slippery then, I don't know. I don't even know how to, <laughs> to put that in the other way. So, I don't know if there's any other questions, something would like to make clear. We, I was hoping to use 30 minutes. I have around five minutes, maybe. Yes, that's, I think that's another hand up. Yes, Fish. Yeah, just a quick one. Okay. Uh, don't we have, uh, I mean, I didn't check, but I was just curious. Don't we have like a cyclical type of cause and effect things, or is that framed in another way? When okay. we come casually. I don't know, maybe you point us to the direction where you saw that, because I'm trying to think if, uh, if temperature will, I don't know, I'm trying to think a cause and effect kind of relationship in any experiment. I don't know any point where the effect would cause the... I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's uh, really uh, weird to think it's like that, but just imagine like uh, like self-limiting behaviors or like, let's just, uh, this is just a, you know, very superficial question. I just came to my mind, maybe I should have searched it first by myself, but imagine a self-limiting behavior or like um, addictive type of things, right? So once you start doing them, the you will begin. Maybe uh, uh, this question is not framed right, or it just came to my mind and I spit it out. But okay, let's let's uh, let's talk about the self-limiting behaviors, right? If I think I'm not going to be able to do something, I'm not going to be able to do it. That mm -hmm. may be the cause. So, and when I see that. I am not doing it, it will strengthen the idea of that which I had in my head, which is I cannot do it. And then the cycle goes on and on. And there are lots of, uh, I think there are many examples like this, for example, addiction and other stuff. You know, maybe they are framed in another way, but I, I don't know, maybe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Feedback loops, yeah, negative positive feedback loops. Okay, so it does seem um, oh, so it makes sense, sense, but I actually think it just still goes in a directed manner because even if it's most habits kind of look circular, that you keep doing the same thing over and over, but you'll notice it always starts with the same point. Maybe I always drink because I get some form of urge, you know, and it's always starting from. It's, there's always something that causes it. So even if I do it today, I do it tomorrow, I do it another day. There's always something that actually causes that. 
that behavior. I don't know if you look it, if you look at it like that, if you still call it um psychic, I don't think that's a psychic fish. What do you think? Yeah, actually it's uh, we it's it's kind of a nice way of framing it, right? Instead of going in a loop, like we can just take the two points and we can just say this caused this and that's the end of it. Yeah, even if it's going, it keeps repeating, it will be the first one for the Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, even, yeah, exactly. Even if it keeps going on and on, but for the, yeah, for this causal model, we can, yeah, exactly. Thanks. Okay. So because I only had 30 minutes, I'd like us to go maybe to how exactly do we do some causal analysis. Of course, we have uh, Leblerys and Python that help us do this easily, causal next do I, and um, Yididia. Yididia will be taking over that. So if other questions, of course, arise during during the practical part, I want the, I think the practical part to take around one hour. And yeah, we could still continue answering questions as they come up. Yididia, are you on the call? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about a bit about causal links. It's one of the tools. <coughs> sorry, it's one of the tools that's available in Python that we can use to uh, build the structure of our model. And uh, after building the structure, we can go ahead and build our model using uh, Bayesian network or even uh, normal logistic regression uh, models. Uh, before I go to uh, to the collab, let me go over some slides, five to six slides, and uh, we'll go over to the demo or practical implementation. So. <clears throat> Uh, as Anastasia has been saying, uh, in causality, we are trying to understand what exactly is the cause of a certain output or effect. And uh, one thing we know for sure, or even you guys might have already gone uh, over some uh, causality, correlation, and association terms. And correlation or association doesn't necessarily imply a causation. So <clears throat> uh, up until now, especially in machine learning, in the machine learning projects or challenges that we've been working on, uh, we have been trying to uh, look at how features are correlated to each other and at how one feature is related to the another feature and so on. But uh, in causation, correlation or association doesn't necessarily imply uh, a causation. Uh, just as an example, uh, let's say uh, uh, maybe, yes, maybe someone planted a tree and uh, and we have, uh, we are getting fruits from that, uh, from that plant or from that tree. And we are also getting green leaves, uh, once that tree is planted and once that uh, tree or plant has grown up and getting a green leaves might be correlated to getting fruits, but it doesn't mean that, uh, it's causing uh, getting green leaves is causing uh, the fruits uh, to grow or something. The actual cause might be uh, watering the plant or so on. <clears throat> so what we are seeing but by causality is that uh, there are certain factors that are actually responsible for the outcome of one of the features that you are interested in or that uh, that's un under their under our study, but we might have multiple uh, features that are correlated or associated to that specific feature. Uh, and correlation or association doesn't necessarily imply causation. So a change in cause implies a change in the effect. So the actual effect or the actual change uh, in the effect or in the feature that we are interested in comes from, <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, let me get better. Uh, okay. Uh, so the actual effect or the actual change uh, in the feature that we are interested in comes from uh, the causation or the causation factor that uh, we want to figure out. So <clears throat> uh, 
uh, causality in machine learning. The study of causality in machine learning is still under development, and there is no mathematical way to measure causality from a given data set uh, because uh, when you are working on a given or <clears throat> on a specific data set, uh, that data set is static in nature, and we can't actually go ahead back in time and uh, have the original source or actually measure the original cause of that specific feature that we are interested in studying. So we can't exactly drive relationships from a static data and uh, find out which feature are causing uh, the change or bringing the effect for some specific uh, feature. So, <clears throat> but association, uh, on the other hand, can be measured directly from a given data set because in a static data set, we can learn and understand the data and uh, point out which features are correlated or which features are associ associated to each other and so on. <clears throat> uh, so good predictive, good predictive models which are based on learning correlations between the data might perform well. Uh, and that might be enough for a predictive model. So when working with predictive models, the underlying structure of the machine learning model is based on uh, building correlations and associations between, between each features and coming up uh, with that specific uh, predictive, uh, with that specific feature that we, that we want to predict uh, at, the, at, the, at the end. But when it comes to optimization problems <clears throat> and health sector data analysis, like explanatory model. For example, uh, we want to explain why certain features are acting in that specific way or in, a specific, in, in, in some specific way. And we want to know the cause of that, uh, of, of, that of those specific features. On that case, uh, just using the normal machine learning models on tail because the normal machine learning models are mostly based on uh, associations and correlations. But in causality, we want to know which, which features are exactly causing or which features are responsible uh, for the causation or for the, uh, for the change of other features. And for example, in, in the health sector, uh, we might be studying uh, which, for example, in, 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 the, in the data set that we are working in the health sector, we might be interested in studying uh, in cancer types that are causing specific types of cancer. And just by implementing a simple machine learning model, we might see that most of the features are correlated or associated with, uh, with the feature that we are interested in or in our, with our target variable. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they are the cause or they are the source of uh, change for that specific feature or for that specific target. So in those, scenarios like optimization problems and the same goes for optimization problems when we are working on optimization problems we are mostly concerned in <clears throat> i'm sorry for my voice guys uh, I'm, I'm having a flu uh, and on optimization problems uh, we are interested in uh, understanding the data and uh, truly getting the feature that is responsible for uh, for a certain outcome so unless we or unless we understand the true cause or the true uh, change factor in our data, we can't really uh, get into uh, a correct uh, conclusion or generalization for that specific optimization problem. And for explanatory models for health sectors, the same goes uh, for those sectors as well. So such models require correlation. Would uh, such models, uh, when we use correlation for such models, we'd go to wrong conclusions and we would affect the business in different the health sector uh, in the wrong way. So relationships uh, between features, we have different relationships, we can have different relationships between features. The first one is previous relation. And this type of relations are, uh, are not really, in, in this type of relationship, in spurious types of relationships, the, the features aren't related at all, but uh, for some reason, they might have the same type of structure and the same type of pattern throughout the, throughout the data set. And those features need to be limited by domain experts and, uh, <coughs> uh, and more study in the data set. Uh, for example, let me show you uh, some examples from spurious correlations that I found on the internet. So uh, if you can see the graph, 
The first one, the red line is US spending on science, space, and technology, while the black line is suicides by hanging, strangulation, and so on. So these two features aren't related at all to, uh, to make a generalization that they have positive correlation or negative correlation or so on. But as we can see, they have the same pattern and uh, one can just come and say that those two features are correlated and uh, the increase in one of the feature will have a positive uh, effect on the other one. But this is a wrong conclusion to make unless this is this issue or this topic might be an obvious, uh, an obvious title, but in the health sector or other tech sectors that we are working on, uh, we might not know that two features aren't correlated at all and make might make we might make some wrong generalization or wrong conclusions and we can also have uh, we can also see into other examples which is the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool and the films Nicolas Cage appeared in and these two titles aren't related at all uh, in this case as well but we can see that we have the same pattern so uh, what spurious relations are <coughs> are two or more features might not be related at all but uh, we can have the same patterns or the same occurrences uh, uh, maybe in the structure or some other factors in in the graph but those features might not be related at all and the second one is the confounding uh, relationships between features and in the confounding one two features are related to each other but they are, one of them is not the cause for the other uh, feature. So in uh, in confounding variables, we might have two related variables in a data set, uh, which doesn't necessarily imply a causation in one of the features that we are interested in, but they have the same pattern or they might have the same uh, causation, but they are not one of them are not one of them is not uh, the cause for the other feature. So most of the time when we deal with confounding variables, we mostly will have uh, another uh, causation for both of the variables or for both of the features, but the two features or the two or more features aren't, uh, uh, aren't the cause for the other feature. And the third one in the relationship is the causal relationship. In the causal re relationship, one of the features or one of the feature is responsible for the cause or for the change in the other uh, in the other feature. So when studying causality, we are interested in understanding the structure of our model and uh, figuring out or finding the true cause uh, of, uh, of some specific features that we are interested in studying. So one of the libraries that's available in Python is CausalNex. This field is still under study and uh, more can be done, but they did an amazing, CausalNex did an amazing job. And uh, it's a Python library, library that uses the Bayesian network to combine uh, machine learning and do domain, domain expertise uh, for causal reasoning. And uh, we can also use CausalNex to uncover structural relationships in data, learn complex distribution and observe uh, the effect of potential interventions. So the main steps that are uh, that we can implement when working with CausalNex uh, are the first one is creating the structure of the data. So once we have our data set, we can uh, immediately create the structure of our model or the structure of our data and uh, look at our at how our data looks like and uh, observe at patterns in our data and uh, understand which features are responsible for the change of other features and so on. So uh, the causal links will provide a general uh, relationship between the features, but uh, with domain experts, we can remove some of the features that aren't relevant and some of the features which are in a wrong, that, that are generalized or uh, plotted in a wrong way and um, fine tune the model or the structure that we have in a way that is more accurate uh, to our field of study. And the second one is fitting the conditional probability distribution. Once we have built the structure, the second thing that we can do is to, uh, to fit the data. So based on the cause and effect relationship, we can fit that data and we can have a probability distribution for each of the features, for each of the features that uh, are in the graph or in the structure. And based on that, we can uh, build our 
build our model, uh, build our own model on top of that. And finally, you can evaluate the impact of variable of interest and uh, make sure that it is accordingly and the true causations for the features that we have in the structure uh, are represented in that structure that we are building. Uh, so now we can <clears throat> uh, we can go uh, to the to the notebook to the collab notebook and uh, go over uh, the code. This code is from the official uh, documentation of Codral Links. Their official documentation is really good, and they provide you with examples and all of the uh, code samples that you'd need to uh, build your own Codral build your own structure and understand the cause and effect relationship between uh, the feature that you are interested in. So the first thing uh, to install Codral Links, the first thing we need to do is uh, we need to install uh, this PyGravis library and other dependencies. Uh, this is for Linux, but uh, I think uh, there is a problem installing uh, this library, Codral Links library in Windows, uh, but try to install it. And uh, if the problem persists, maybe we can debug that together. Uh, but if you are on Colab, we can simply install uh, some dependencies, the graphics and some other dependencies. And uh, we can we should also install the PyGraphics. Py this is for visualization. And these are the requirements for uh, Codral Links. After installing that, we can then go ahead and install Codral Links. And uh, we will import Codral Links and make sure our installation is successful. Uh, I've then uh, imported some required libraries for building the structure. Uh, and uh, I've mounted my drive and loaded uh, a dataset from uh, from the drive. This example is this all of this core sample is provided in the official documentation of Codral Linux, and uh, you can go ahead and find that on the official documentation. So this dataset is about uh, this is a student per performance dataset, and uh, what we are interested in uh, in building the model using this dataset is we want. Uh, to know or predict if a student will fail uh, given that certain factors that will uh, uh, that will uh, affect the student's performance or the student's grade and uh, will be the cause for the student's failure or uh, passing in his grade in his grade so uh, we have lots of features lots of columns in our data set and uh, one of them is school sex age address farm size and so on uh, so after uh, looking at our data set, you can also look at the columns. Uh, this is the links. Uh, this is the list of columns that we have in our data set, uh, and we can also find the uh, attribute information. And uh, the first thing that we need to do when uh, working with causal networks or even any other type of machine learning is uh, we need to understand the data that we are going to work on. We need to understand the features and. Uh, just by reading the attributes information, we will know. We will at least know uh, the basic features that we have, and uh, at least have an understand a basic understanding uh, of the data that we are going to work on. But especially when working with health data set and related uh, critical data sets, we definitely will need uh, uh, experts analysis on on the data. Uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, to build the structure, as I've said uh, earlier on the PowerPoint presentation, the first thing that we need to do is we need to build the structure of the model. So to build the structure of the model, uh, Codral Linux uh, provides the structure, and from the structure we can uh, easily build models uh, of our of our data that we are going to work on. So to first build uh, an empty network, we just can instantiate the structure model, and then uh, we'll. Uh, we can look at we can look at the edges and the nodes that we have in our model. So SM.h will give the edges that we have in our model. And to visualize that, to plot that in uh, in a more nicer way and in a way that we can see it, we can see the nodes and the edges much more clear, uh, clearly. We can use the uh, the library that we installed above, which is the uh, PyGravis, and using that library. Uh, we can visualize uh, our data. So this is for the MPT uh, for the MPT structure. So it doesn't contain any node and it doesn't also contain any uh, edges. So this will be empty. So to add maybe uh, on 
the student's data set, we might know some features that are uh, that are the cause for some specific features. And uh, we might, for example, talk to some domain experts in the field and uh, conclude that some features are uh, really the cause of some specific features. So for example, hails might be the cause for absence. So if someone isn't feeling good or is, if someone isn't feeling well, uh, you might not uh, go to the school and attend these classes. So hails might be the cause for absences and also hails will also be uh, the cause for uh, the grade of the student. So we can add features that we think uh, are the cause of some specific features and those features will be reflected in our structure or in the general model that Kujual Next will be uh, building for us. So now if we just print out the age, we can see that health is uh, actually the cause for absence and health will also be uh, the cause for the grade of that student. So to realize that using uh, PyGravis, we can use the plot structure and we'll give the model that we used, the structure that we built, and then uh, some other attributes. And uh, this is the visualization that PyGravis can provide us. So as we can see from the graph, this is something that uh, domain experts or someone who knows well about the student's performance can build on without, without even using Kojolnix. But Kojolnix, uh, is also can also build the structure of the entire data, uh, and uh, after the, after we get the Kojolnix data structure, after we get the structure of the data, after we get the structure of the data from Kojolnix, we can manually go ahead and remove some of the features that aren't relevant and some of the effects that aren't relevant in that specific model. So uh, based on the uh, the output of the of the domain expert, we can see that. Hales is the cause for absence, and uh, Hales is also the cause for the grade of the students. Uh, so instead of doing that, since we have a large data set with multiple columns, what we will do is uh, we let Kojolnix build the structure by itself. And after having a look at the data set or at the structure that Kojolnix uh, built or plotted, we can go ahead and manually remove some of the edge, some of the nodes, which might not be important for that structure. We can also go ahead and add some of the uh, relationships or cause and effect relationships by putting the node and the effect, which is also another node into the structure. And we can uh, tune it more to fit uh, to the business that we are working with. So to build the structure, we just, uh, we are just visualizing or we are just getting the summary of our data and uh, <clears throat> we'll first remove columns that aren't relevant or that won't affect uh, the student's performance. So the school might not, might not at a, this might affect if you know the, uh, the school type, the school standard and so on. But if you don't, we can remove that because uh, we can't just uh, make a cause and effect relationship from a given school name and sex, age, and other uh, other features uh, should not have uh, a cause or a cause and effect relationship with the student's performance. So we remove those features from our uh, data set. Then after dropping that, we can see that uh, we have the other features remaining. And uh, by using uh, the numeric and the categorical uh, variables, we can build the structure. So for Kojual uh, at first we are listing the non-numeric columns uh, from the entire data. And uh, these are uh, categorical variables. So we need to handle them uh, independently because uh, Kojual can mostly work with numerical data. So we are converting that using the label encoder and uh, we are uh, transforming them into numeric variables. And after transforming, we can see all of our features are in uh, a numeric format. Then uh, to build the structure using Kojolnix, we just need to import from pandas from kojolnix.structure.notirs. Notirs is the algorithm that Kojolnix uses to build the structure between uh, our features in the, in the given data set. So using the Notirs, uh, there is lots of stats going on behind the notirs algorithm, but using that specific library, 
Codronics can build, can analyze and study the relationship between each of the features that we have in our, in our data set and come up with uh, the structure of our data. So uh, uh, we can get that uh, by using the from pandas method that's available and we'll give our data that has been cleaned. By cleaned, I mean that uh, transform into numerical uh, features and uh, some of the features that aren't relevant for our study uh, are removed. Then we can plot that uh, we can plot the relationship that was built by using Codralnix and uh, let me run this. In. Okay, this will take a while because. Uh, it's building the relationship based on uh, the entire records that are in the data set. Uh, so this will build the structure, then we can visualize uh, our structure using the PyGraphis library, and this will give us a very large uh, structure of our model, but from that structure, uh, we might find that some of the relationships aren't accurate. So based on uh, expert domain analysis, some of the features might not be relevant. Some of the cause and effect relationships might not be relevant. And uh, we can manually go ahead and remove those uh, cause and effect relationships from that uh, structure. We can also go ahead and add uh, a specific cause and relationship to that structure that uh, uh will return. Uh, it's a bit resource intensive, so uh, if you guys are work, going to work on your machine, uh, I think it needs a good uh, processing power. Mm. And now? Yes, uh, while it's working, uh, can you tell us how Cosa Nix uh, builds this structure? Is it calculating? Correlations, or what is it? What is it doing? I mean, uh, no, it, it's it's not uh, it's not calculating correlations because uh, the main goal of uh, the main goal of Codronix's project was to actually drive the causation for certain features. So correlations doesn't necessarily imply cause and effect relationship. So uh, by by causality, we are referring to the cause of some specific features or to some uh, specific effect. So we want to find out which features are exactly the causes uh, for some uh, features effect. So for example, in the student's performance, a student might, might pass or fail in his grades. And we want to know which features are directly responsible for uh, the student's performance outcome. So uh, if he fails, which features are the cause for students' failure, and if he passes, which features are uh, the cause uh, for the student's success in his grades? So uh, the Notice library is trying its an algorithm built by Codralnix, and it's trying to understand the structure from the data, and uh, it will build the structure based on the cause and effect relationship that it finds uh, when working with the data. Internet? Yes, uh, I just don't understand how it finds uh, this cause and effect uh, relationships. If it's not a mathematical thing, uh, it's not very clear for me. Uh, yes, it's still, we can't still go back to some point in time and we can't exactly understand which are the cause and uh, which are, which factor, which features are responsible for uh, the outcome of the student's performance, but it will try to based on the entire data that we have given to the library, it will try uh, to remove the, the correlations from the data. So some features might be correlations, but not the cause of that relations, but some of them might be the cause for, them, for some specific feature. So it will try to drop out, uh, okay, I don't know how I can explain it, uh, I'm not even an expert in the field, to be honest, but what it will do is, uh, for example, let's say we have 
uh, a variable uh it me we have a variable a and this might be the cause for variable b and the same variable a might be the cause for uh, uh for feature c and uh, in some case in most cases uh feature b will be correlated to feature c right so what causal links in the general overview what causal links will try to do is it will break uh it will break the relationship between a and b and it will also break the relationship between a and c and it will try this is not uh causal links will not only use uh, the features one specific or one single feature uh, for one specific outcome but it will try to combine multiple features that we have from the data set and after breaking the relationships from both features it will try to understand if those two features are correlated and if they can exist separately or independently from uh, their cause factors so it's a bit uh, yeah, it, it's mostly statistical implementation that's happening in the background of causal links, but it's not going back in time and understanding the cause for that specific outcome. It's just trying to guess around uh, by going through different features and understanding the data structure that is uh, in the entire data set. Uh, okay, so it, it might be complicated to try to understand right now, but um, let me add to this. Is it uh, is um uh, it is it giving us possibilities for causation relationship? It's not like it's not telling us like yes, this is a cause of this, but it's giving us uh, what yes, uh, yes yeah yes it's it, it will give us it will return the probability distribution of each cause and effect relationships. Some of them might be uh, uh, tightly coupled to each other and. Uh, let's say some of them ha have a probability of above 80 percent for some uh, they might have a probability of less than 20 percent and so on so it will give the probability distribution for each of the cause and effect in the structure of our data and we might go ahead and remove uh, the weakly correlated not correlated but the weakly connected uh, nodes from our graph yes uh, so uh, this is the final question uh okay, is it is it is it is it doing uh, some kind of machine learning it's not it's not applying mathematical uh formulas like i mean, uh, I mean is, yeah the, the implementation of machine learning is task six right after all Machine learning, uh, we might have lots of uh, libraries that are available to uh, for machine learning algorithms, but uh, the bottom implementation in most machine learning algorithms is task six, right? Is that is guess what? Sorry. So the 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 implementation for machine learning models is task six, not only task six, but, but six, yes, yeah, yes. So. The same logic is being applied, but in a different way. They are using different statistics, statistical algorithms to come up with those probabilities. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I admit I don't completely understand, but I think, yeah, at least I have an idea of, of what it is using. Well, okay, thank you. Okay, yes. Um, as I've said, I'm not... Uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure how they implemented the entire model. I think, but it, it's, uh, if I'm not wrong, it's an open source uh, uh, implementation. So we can go ahead and look at the statistical implementation of the model, but they are using statistical algorithm to come up with the, uh, with the structure of our data. So after building, after using this method from, uh, from the library, this will build the structure for the entire data and it will put it in a form of cause and effect for each of the nodes or for each of the features that we have in our data set. Uh, I think this has completed. If I now run the visualization. Okay, this will also take a while. Yes. So uh, we are plotting the entire data. So some of them are weakly connected. Some of them are strongly connected. Uh, as you can see, this 
uh, this structure tried to include all of the features that is that are in our data set and uh, point out the relationships between each features or each nodes uh, in the structure so uh, some of them might not be relevant some of them might have re weaker relationship so what we can do is this is in a form of a dag as anastasia said so dags point out from one node to the other but not the other way around so this is a cyclic graph so each feature or each node is pointing to the other node, but the other node is not pointing back uh, to the source node. So what we are saying here is that, uh, for example, failures might be a specific cause for other nodes and the failures node will point out to other nodes, uh, which is causing uh, the effect in those features. So what we can do is uh, we can use the threshold. So we can remove a below threshold that is 80%. So we'll be removing uh, the features that aren't strongly connected or doesn't really have a strong effect or a strong cause uh, for the effect of other features. So after running this, we can see most of uh, the edges have been removed and we have uh, a lighter graph, a lighter structure. And we can now uh, see at how our structure is developed and at uh, at the nodes or at the features which have uh, an effect on other uh, on other features. So, uh, for example, uh, we can see that this is the absence, and uh, internet might be the reason for absence, paid might be the reason for absence, failures might be the, the reason for absence, and so on. So, uh, so for the grid, uh, multiple features might be responsible for might be the cause for this effect study time is one of the cause for this effect which is the grid which is true and the address uh, i'm not sure how how much address can affect or how much address can be the cause for the grid but uh, this is what the model has come up with and other features will uh, others will uh, other features uh, cause and effect will be also uh, depicted in the graph that uh, uh, that casual next builds for us. So after having a look at the structure that uh, casual next provides or builds, we can go ahead and remove some of the uh, some of the features which aren't relevant or some of the features which are uh, represented in the wrong or uh, in a way that 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 isn't accurate uh, in our structure. So for example, uh, higher and medu, we can go ahead and see. Uh, the higher feature is the cause for medu. So we can go ahead to the attributes and look. So medu is, uh, sorry. So medu is the mother's education. So, and the higher is, uh, higher. Uh, and, as and higher wants to take higher education. So uh, the student's interest in taking higher education doesn't, can't be the cause for the mother's education, right? So uh, in our structure, what Kojolniks came up with was higher is the source or is the cause for uh, mother's education status. So mother's education status can't actually be the, uh, the outcome or the effect uh, for the students' interest uh, to go ahead and study in higher education. But I think uh, mother's education might be the cause uh, for students' interest in uh, going to the higher education. So what we can do is we can, rem we can remove those edges, those uh, nodes from our graph because uh, they are represented in the wrong way that, that isn't that is completely uh, incorrect in our structure. So to remove that, we can use the tab edges. So uh, what this will do is it will impose edges that are not allowed in the Kojal model. And we're running the structure again. When we run the structure again, uh, those fields or those uh, features that are in the tab edges attribute will be removed from, uh, from the graph or from the structure that we are going to build. So after running this, uh, we will see that those features, those cause and defect features uh, are now removed from our structure. Uh, and then what we can do is 
based on some domain experts, especially we will do this not only in health sectors, but uh, in other uh, data sets that you are going to work on, we will mostly consult with uh, domain experts and uh, we might get some additional features which, uh, which uh, would be the cause uh, for some certain features in our data set. So we can add edges by just using uh, on our model. <coughs> on our model, we can add the cause and the effect relationship. The cause will be the first one in the uh, in the par in the arguments, and the second one will be the effect. And we can add multiple uh, features, you know, as our cause and effect relationship. And now, if you if you uh, rerun the structure based on the given uh, based on the given uh, new cause and effect relationships, those changes will be reflected in our new data structure or in our new structure that Kojol Nix came up uh, before. And we will see that, uh, for example, failures to G1. G1 is here and failures, yes. So I hope this age is, yes, this age should be for failures. So failures is the cause for G1. And the other edge was p status. Mm. P status, yes. P status is the cause for from rail and the absence we used for G1. It's uh, removed. It removed. It was removed. Oh yes, it's removed. Yes, thank you, Tanar. So we removed two edges, which is the address to G1 and p status to G1, but we added failures to G1, so those changes will be reflected in our structure. So based on some domain analysis and uh, some consultations, we can add and remove uh, some edges from our structure that aren't relevant or uh, that are represented in an incorrect way. Uh, so if we see at the structure that was given above, we can see that we have two separate graphs. So the first subgraph is from Galk to Walk, and the second graph is the bigger one. Uh, so to build the model uh, using the structure that is given, we will only need a single model in our uh, structure. So we'll be removing one of them that won't affect the distribution and that won't affect the outcome. So uh, we can, this is, since this is a single uh, relationship, you can drop this edge from our model and we can uh, go ahead with the bigger model. So what we are doing here is uh, we, we are selecting the largest subgraph in our model. We might have multiple subgraphs. Uh, we will only select the largest subgraph that will represent our data and uh, the, the graph that uh, we can be able to build our model and probability distribution on top of that. So after the selecting the largest subgraph, all of the other subgraphs that aren't as large as this, as this graph will be removed from uh, from the structure and we'll only be looking at the largest structure. And finally, after this is the structure that we came up with. So we can see that uh, uh, for Juan, we have uh, other causes, which is the study time, the school sub, the higher, the failures, and some other features are relevant. So uh, after having a look at our data, at our structure of the data, we can go ahead and build the model uh, on top of the structure. So uh, the first thing when building the probability distribution, especially when building the Bayesian uh, model, all of uh, our data needs to be discretized, meaning that it needs to be in, uh, in, a, in a small range that is uh, suitable for the model. So if you have a very large uh, difference in our data, in a specific feature of our data, uh, Bayesian network will not be able to conclude uh, or to generalize well from that specific given data set. So what we are doing by discretizing our data is that we are, uh, we are categorizing or we are uh, making a classification problem so that uh, Bayesian network, Bayesian model will be able to understand uh, the data structure easily from the given data set. So we are mapping for the failures. Uh, if V is equal to zero from the failures feature, if V is equal to zero, uh, we are saying it's a no failure. And uh, if it is in the other, uh, if, if it has other values other than uh, other than zero, we are giving a failure. And for the study time, uh, we are classifying, we are, we are 
uh, splitting it into two categories. The first one is the short study time, and the second one is the long study time. And uh, we are narrowing, narrowing down the number of unique values in those features. And we are finally mapping that into uh, the failures and the study time feature. Uh, the, the second thing is for the numeric features as well. For example, absences, uh, if we print out the number of unique uh, values in that specific column, we can see that we have uh, different unique values in that column. So we are also going to try to narrow the list of uh, the list of values that are in that specific feature. The same goes for G1. So uh, in Kojol Next, you can use the script uh, library that is available, and we can uh, use the classification or the uh, feature split based on some specific inputs. For example, for absences, what we are doing is we are giving the minimum, the maximum, and I think all of the values that are less than one are going to be put in a specific category. And uh, for range between one to 10 in these absences, this is, yes, th these were the unique values for absences. And all of the values that are between one and 10 will be put into a separate category. And other variable, other values that are greater than or equal to 10 will be put into uh, a separate category. So we'll be having three different categories for absences, and this will make it much more easier for Peja network, and it will also increase the accuracy. We'll do the same thing for G1, G2, and G3. And after building that, uh, if we look uh, at the unique, at the number of unique values in the absences, we can see that we only have three unique values, which is one, zero, two, because we have classified it or we have categorized it uh, into three different uh, categories. And the same goes for G1 because we have only used one uh, value as our numeric split points. We will only get two uh, distinct values in uh, G1. <clears throat> then we can also go ahead and uh, create labels for other categories that are in our data set. And the final or the end goal by discretizing is to, uh, to first uh, change all of the columns into numerical form. And second, uh, to build, uh, uh, to narrow down the number of unique values in each of uh, the features that we have. And finally, we'll build the normal model that we have been doing when building a machine learning model. We are splitting our data and uh, we are using the discrete size data for the training and the train size is going to be 0 0.9 and the test size is going to be 0 0.1. So the XY split will be uh, 90 to 10%. Then we are importing the Bayesian network and uh, we are instantiating the model by using the, the structure model that we have uh, built above. So this is a same, which is which just gets the largest subgraph from uh, the model. Then finally, uh, after instantiating or after uh, initializing the Bayesian network, uh, what you can do is we'll do we'll fit the node states. So each node will have uh, a specific value or probability given for each node for the cause and the, for the effect. So on the dark graphs, each node will be assigned a specific state and we are first fitting that node state. And then this is where we perform the conditional probability distribution. So for the binomial distribution, we are giving the train, uh, which is the data that we want, that we are interested in. We are specifying the method in the base prior. And when fitting the conditional probability distribution, it is going to calculate or it is going to uh, perform the statistical analysis for each of the nodes that are present in our uh, data set and uh, actually using the causes for each of the features that are in our structure. So for example, for the grade one uh, feature, we had a couple of uh, a couple of features that are the cause for that uh, grade feature and it's assigning probability for each of the causes uh, that are in that specific feature. So for the grade or for the passing or failing, uh, we had about four or five different features that are uh, the cause for that specific feature. And it, it, it's going to assign uh, some kind of probability for each of the feature or for each of the cause uh, for that specific feature. Then, for example, we can, uh, this is 
going to create a key in dictionary pair. This is going to create a dictionary, so we can access it with, uh, using the key value pair. So for G1, we can see that failures, higher school apps, and study time are uh, the features that are uh, the cause for this specific uh, feature. If you go back to uh, yes, to the graph or to the structure, we can see that uh, for G1, study time, school sub, higher end failures were the cause. Here as well, we can see that the failure, the higher in the school apps in the study time is actually the cause uh, for uh, for this specific feature. Uh, and then <clears throat> we can also look, uh, we can also have a look at the absences uh, feature and uh, we can see that the P status, the address, the failure, the internet, the paid, the absences are the cause for that uh, specific outcome. So by fitting that, the conditional probability distribution will assign probability for each of the causes and uh, it will come up uh, uh, with some kind of mapping and we, we can predict from that uh, model if a student will pass or fail uh, uh, on his grades. So to make prediction, we can uh, use the predict same way that we've been using when predicting the machine learning model and bend dot predict and the discretized data. And we are trying to predict the G1. So we are trying to predict uh, for the failure or if the student will fail or if the student will pass. Uh, if I now print uh, the predictions, it's just a list of pass and fail. So it's going to predict for each of the records and uh, we can get the G1 underscore prediction, which is the target or the outcome uh, that you are interested in studying. So for example, if you look at uh, one specific uh, record, we can use the look and we will uh, target one specific record in our data set, which is the 18th record. And uh, we'll print out all of the features that are uh, in that data set without G1. So we just want to see other features in that data set, in that the, in that specific record and the address is you, the family size is uh, has some specific value and so on. So from these given uh, parameters or from these given features, the Bayesian network based on the structure that was built, uh, it will assign the probability for uh, the actual causes of those features and uh, it will calculate that and uh, we can get the, uh, the final outcome that the student will pass or the student will fail. So the prediction is uh, is actually fail. So when you predict for from the prediction that we did earlier, uh, yes, from this one, if we if we if we locate the uh, the 18th row, we can see that it is a fail. And uh, to get the ground result, we can also print from the discretized data in the 18th. Uh, record, we can also see that this is also a fail. So uh, based on the structure, it will enable us to see how uh, our data is related to each other, which factors are the cause for some specific outcomes or for some specific effects. And by understanding that, uh, we can come up with a better solution for, especially for uh, optimization, for explanatory decisions that we are going to make. But for most predictive, uh, scenarios, you might not necessarily need the cause and effect relationship, but uh, when it comes to uh, some generalization, some optimization problems, we'll definitely need to look into uh, cause and effect relationships. And one of the tools that you can use in Python is the core Uh Is there any question? <coughs> yes, Simtina. Uh, yeah, so what was the goal of splitting the data into um, training and test? Uh, we are splitting the data into training and test so that we can validate the accuracy from the test set based on the training data. This is the same approach that uh, we have been following when building a normal machine learning model. So you would split the data and you use the test set as the validation and uh, your module will be trained on that on the train data or on the x variable on the x for the train variable and we'll test that uh, based on the train data we'll test the test set based on the, based on the train data um okay so um 
Um, yeah, so ca can you clarify again what we are measuring? Since you said that uh, predictions, we don't need the, the causation links to, to, for, for predictions. So if we are testing, uh, we're basically testing if our model is predicting the values, right, of um, yes. our target. So yes. is this, is this uh, a test of uh, the causation? Uh, graph that we, oh, I mean, the causation um, relations we, we have measured, or, or is it really, um, if it, uh, uh, sorry, I don't know if I, I phrased this correctly. Um, before you stated that for prediction models, for building pred prediction models, we don't need to know the causation relations between our variables. We only we need don't, we don't yes? yes, we don't necessarily need. I think it's based to actually know the causation for each of the effects, especially for the target variable. But uh, predictive models can perform well without even knowing the causation. If you have a good model with good parameters, with uh, a very good model tuned well, uh, that will or that might work well, uh, and that 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 might not necessarily need the causation for the target variable. But especially when working with optimization problems, let's say you are working in a certain place and for a certain company and they want to optimize the way that they are implementing something. In that case, unless you know the actual cause uh, for each of the features, especially for the target variable, you won't be able to do much uh, with just correlations because with correlations, you know that some features are correlated, but you won't exactly know which feature is the cause uh, for that specific outcome or for that specific effect. Okay, uh, okay, but then uh, our test to test if our causation, the causation relations are we found are correct. Um, it shouldn't the test be an optimization test, not a prediction test? I don't know if I'm making sense. If this makes sense, but. So how, how can you taste optimization in your data? I don't know because... Okay, um, so uh, what uh, what we'll do, for example, when you're working for a certain company, if there is an optimization problem or uh, you want, maybe you'll want to know uh, what actually is uh, affecting some or what actually is... Uh, the cause for some specific effect. Uh, maybe let me go to the health sector and uh, um, yes, okay, L let me just uh, bring up the cancer uh, in the health sector. So let's say someone has some specific type of cancer. I'm not exactly sure about the terms. That's why I'm not mentioning the terms in the cancer. The benign, yes, there is the benign in the melanin one, but in those, uh, types of uh, cases, we want to exactly know what is causing those features. We might say that uh, this and this is correlated to this and uh, they actually are the causation uh, for those effects. But that actually won't be true, right? Especially when, uh, when performing some kind of model or when building some kind of model to actually predict in the health sector when you actually want to predict if someone uh, has some specific type of cancer, the correlated factors won't by itself help unless we know uh, the actual cause for those effects. So by causation, we are trying to understand what exactly is the cause uh, for those effects rather than just understanding the correlations for those features or for those effects. Yeah, yes, uh, I, I cannot think uh, how should the optimization problem work unless we actually go on the ground and change things, implement the change, and then see if we get uh, a good result or not. I, I don't see how we can test this just from yes, the data that, we have. Yes, that, that will be costly to actually go ahead and uh, test each of the scenarios unless we have a good model and we are certain that this and these are these features are the cause uh, for this effect, and we need to change that. Uh, those features uh, 
uh, in order to optimize our solution that we are working for that starting when working in that uh, specific company. So we just can't go ahead and try all of the options, but if we can actually map the cause to the effects and truly understand which of the features are the cause for that specific effect, we can change or we can alter uh, those causes and uh, test that in the real world, uh, which might be expensive, but at least we know that they are really the cause uh, for the effect and we can optimize that. Okay, okay. Um, okay, thank you for explaining. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other question? Yeah. Okay, then I think uh, we can end the session here. Yes. Uh, sorry for my voice and uh, we'll be available on Slack if you have any questions. Tomorrow we'll be more focused on uh, visualization. Yes, Nahum, I will share the notebook. Uh, Michael? So, Yididia, I was uh, looking to ask, uh, does using DVC mean that we are sharing the data uh, or can we use uh, DVC to work with the data for this week's challenge? Yes, you, you'll only be using DVC to model or version your data, right? You don't have yeah. any other, uh, you, you so won't be using... I, I mean that our data will be stored on the Google Drive. So uh, does that be against the non-disclosure agreement? Oh, okay. Uh, okay, maybe let's... Uh, Mm. I think it's okay if you store it on your own Google Drive. Yeah, and yeah. Yes, that, that, that won't be a problem. If there is a change, uh, we will update you on that. Maybe we will discuss okay. with the team and we will update you on that. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. Uh, great. Thanks, guys.